Happy New Year, everybody. It's good to be with you. My name is Kathy Roberts. I am the former teaching director of the uh, sister class of yours, the day class, and it is really my privilege to be able to be here and to teach uh, tonight. And I thank John for uh, allowing me to do that. And I have no joke, I'm sorry, no jokes. I'll, I'll leave that to John, he is the joke master. But I do have one announcement, uh, and that is many of you uh, knew Missy uh, McCroskey, you might have known her as Missy Chavez, and she passed away uh, on December 14th. And her memorial service will be at First Presbyterian Church in Concord, where she used to teach. She was the first teaching director of the class that uh, became the full day class and also became your class, which started out as the evening and then became co-ed and now is online. So uh, anyway, she um, had been ill, uh, passed away, and we are uh, delighted that First Presbyterian uh, will be able to host her memorial on January 30th at 1 p.m. in the afternoon. Sorry, January 20th. <laughs> I knew that. I knew that. Anyway, that's, uh, that's the one announcement that I have. So, we are going to see some family hostilities today uh, that resulted in a tragedy, tragedy upon tragedy for lots and lots of people. And this, of course, is not just a biblical phenomenon. We have seen it throughout history rich, poor, royal families, and farmers. Now, I don't know, uh, I know you don't remember them personally, but I'm sure you've heard the stories of the Hatfields and McCoys. They are often today the subject of jokes and even songs, but their story really is a sad uh, reality. They lived on the border between West Virginia and Kentucky, and it was a family feud dating from the Civil War until the turn of the century. And in that feud, 12 people were killed. So how did it start? It started over a stolen pig and a forbidden, ill-fated love match. Look it up on the internet if you want the gory details. So how did it end? By the time of the last killing, in 1896, the guy who started it all, by the name of Devil, who would give their kid a nickname of Devil, uh, his name was Devil Anne's Hatfield, by that time he had been converted, baptized, and was living respectably on money from his coal lands. So did that excuse him from what went on before? I kind of wonder what he thought as he read 2 Samuel. Let's pray. Lord, we are thanking you as we enter this new year that we have the privilege of studying your word, and especially in these last chapters of 2 Samuel, of seeing how applicable that word is to us in our world today. So as we open the first pages uh, of the new year, we ask that your spirit would be with us, guiding us and showing us exactly what you would have us learn. In Jesus' name, amen. So for anybody uh, who wondered if this was going to be one of those Bible studies where all they do is talk about sin and disaster and terrible consequences for dastardly deeds, you are in luck because today is the day at CBS. And much as I might like, to uh, take on a different subject matter this morning or this evening, uh, we know that we cannot mess with the Word of God. And big time sin is where we're at in our study of David. History knows David, we've studied it, as the man after God's own heart. But David is no stranger to sin and to its consequences. And uh, today what we're seeing is are some of the most tragic of those consequences, and we're going to see even more next week. So, I'm sorry, but I found that I just couldn't title this lecture without the word sin. 
So I decided to give it one of those old-fashioned novel kind of titles, the kind that explain the entire plot uh, all on the cover. The Sins of the Fathers and the Sons and the Brothers and the Uncles and the Cousins and the Nephews and literally there wasn't anybody left out in David's family of this convoluted and incestuous cycle of sin. Now our lesson tried to help us get a handle on that with a small chart, but it didn't even begin to plumb the depths. And this is where we're gonna be going with it today. In chapter 13, we'll be looking at abomination. In 14, at alienation. And in 15, at rebellion. Now this is a very simple outline, and I will flesh it out as we go um, through the main characters. There was lots of material, lots of storylines, so I'm going to try and boil it down for us today. Now, before we left on our Christmas break, we had the story of David and Bathsheba, and that was the story of sin and repentance and restoration of a right relationship with God. Well, Missy, whose celebration of life uh, I mentioned, used to call that story bath, bed, and beyond. Now, we've seen the bath and we've seen the bed, and today we are going to continue on into the beyond. In fact, as Nathan the prophet declared in chapter 12, verses 10 uh, through 12, now therefore, he's speaking to David, the sword will never never depart from your house because you took the wife of Uriah the Hittite, that was Bathsheba, to be your own. Out of your own household, I am going to bring calamity upon you. That's where the sons and the brothers and the nephews and the cousins all come in. And those terrible consequences are truly the beyond of our lesson today. Now we have seen uh, a lot in the news in recent years about leftover explosive that, explosives that never detonated in various parts uh, around the world after the conflict was over. And many years later, they continue to pose danger and sometimes even bring death to those who are innocent and stumble upon them. And that is the situation that is now existing in David's family. Many innocents are going to be hurt when the buried bombs go off, when the consequences of sin explode and explode again in David's family. And I've chosen as the key verse for the lesson today, not a verse from this uh, particular passage, but from Hosea chapter 8, verse 7. They sow the wind and reap the whirlwind. The whirlwind of our passage today was sown by David as he took many wives and fathered many children with his sin culminating uh, in the affair with Bathsheba. And now that whirlwind lets loose in David's house and innocence will suffer. The results and continuing consequences are nothing but whirlwind after whirlwind of pain. And it is a pain that begins in the lesson today in chapter 13 with abomination. The central core of that chapter is the rape of Tamar and the murder of Amnon. And the characters we're going to look at uh, are going to be just the three. Amnon, who begins by being lovesick, becomes sin sick, and in the end he is just, in my view, just plain sickening. Then we have Tamar. She is powerless, she will be shamed, and she becomes invisible. And finally, we have Absalom, who kind of starts out as if he is his sister's defender, becomes a murderer, and eventually is on the run. So you read all the details in that long chapter. Amnon is lovesick as he contemplates a relationship with his beautiful half-sister, Tamar. He then becomes sin-sick as he plots with his friend and also his cousin, Jonadab, to get uh, permission from his father, David, to bring Tamar to him and feed him and all of that 
you know, and then finally, in a sickening conclusion, he succeeds in raping Tamar, who then becomes the object of his hatred and rejection. It is all just sickening. And although Tamar is eventually safe in her brother Absalom's home, she has no hope of marriage or children. She's no longer a virgin. She is damaged goods, and so she has no value to her family as a potential wife in, in a good political alliance. And that's something that her renowned beauty would have made very possible. And what is worse? She is not defended by her father at all. Yes, it says in verse 21, he is very angry. But you know, so was I when my children tracked mud into my you know, house and went all over my clean kitchen floor. This is hardly a response to the rape of your daughter. This is a time for righteous anger and action, and yet David does nothing. At least Absalom kind of acts like her defender. He takes in his sister, but does he actually stand up for her? No. He puts her into hiding. He says, live here, be content, don't talk about it, forget it. And it becomes one of those secrets, those hidden things that just smolder, just like they do today. Tamar was alive, but she was essentially invisible. Tamar's rape was not only an abomination, it was a crime, and Amnon deserved to be punished. He showed no remorse, no repentance. In fact, he got away with it, at least for a while. But the buried bomb is ticking away in Absalom. Two years, years, two years pass, and we read the sequel. Absalom has not forgotten uh, his hatred of his half-brother Amnon, and he plots, and again with David's reluctant permission, the scenario is set, and Amnon is murdered at a sheep shearing party. Now, Absalom might not have wielded the sword, but he is just as guilty as if he had struck that mortal blow. Sexual sin, Leading to murder, is this sounding familiar? The sins of the father, the sins of the sons. And again, David does nothing. Absalom goes on the run, flees to his grandfather's home, and the bomb is buried again. You know, there is so much here for us. It doesn't matter if we have young children or teens, if we are parents as I am to adult children, grandparents, or if we just have to deal with people who sin in our lives. And since that is a universal condition, nobody is excused from the lessons of this passage. David was great at sweeping things under the rug and walking around the elephant in the living room as if this behemoth was part of the decor. It's hard to believe that David either didn't know or didn't acknowledge that his two sons, Amnon and Absalom, hadn't spoken in two years and that he couldn't discern that maybe we have like a major problem here. But he then allows them to go off without any supervision or oversight or anything. What we see here is that passivity is equally as abusive as a parent who is too harsh or too controlling. David is angry. He's angry twice in this account, and yet he does nothing with the anger. And maybe your experience has been like mine. Angry people who don't know what to do with their anger either blow up or clam up. One is a detonated bomb. The other is a bomb waiting to blow, and both of them are lethal to themselves and to those who will feel the ramifications of it. To be angry is not a sin. Righteous anger is a characteristic of God. David should have been angry. He should have confronted both Amnon and Absalom over their sins. He should have demanded confession and determined a consequence. And yet, he did nothing. 
Amnon got away with rape and Absalom got away with murder, just like David had done with Uriah. But did Absalom really get away with it? For Absalom, we don't hear anything about repentance. This whole thing, situation, becomes fuel for the fire of his ambition. He's ticking. And are we getting what I think is the main point of the whole lesson this week? It's really simple. Sin hurts everyone. So let's look now at chapter 14, at the alienation that came about as a result of this whole story between David and Absalom. Here we see David, who continues to have his head in the sand, and for Absalom, the plot thickens. For two years, Absalom uh, waited to avenge Tamar's rape. For three years, he is absent from Jerusalem. And for another two, he is excluded from David's presence. That is a very long time out, even for a grievous situation. And the bomb is not diffused, it's ticking away. With the cunning and conniving help of his cousin Joab, a meeting is finally arranged between David and Absalom. But it is one of formality, not intimacy. The seeds of bitterness have been planted, have been sown in the heart of Absalom. Now, while not excusing Absalom's behaviors, it would be very easy for an armchair psychologist, and we're all one of those, to find reasons for David, uh, for Absalom's attitude toward David, not as his king, but as the father who had rejected his son, had turned his face away from him and just didn't even seem to care. Those seeds would soon find growth in the whirlwind of total rebellion. If Absalom could not find what he needed in his father, the king, then he would be king himself. And in our families, we all know it, there are often so many issues between fathers and their children. Some fathers are passive, as David was. Head in the sand is often a very comfortable place to be. Others are controlling, or some are harsh. Others are lenient, some are demanding, authoritarian. Others think they really can be their children's friends all the time, and therefore they turn aside from confronting significant parent-child issues. We see personality difference. We have misunderstandings, unmet needs and desires on both sides. Some want the last word all the time, and others don't say a word at all. This is blow up, clam up. And where is mom? Often in the middle. So I'm often speaking to a class of women, but. Everybody knows what it feels like to be in the middle. When you're caught between dad and the kids, or maybe you're caught between mom and the kids, before you jump in or out, what we want to do is turn to Malachi uh, chapter 4, verse 6, and get on our knees and pray, as it says there, that God would turn the hearts of the fathers, the parents, to their children, and the hearts of the children to their fathers. That has been a prayer of mine for years. And even though my sons are both in their 40s, I still need to pray that prayer. And I would also pray that, like David, all the fathers, all the mothers, and the children would first seek after God's own heart themselves. That would make all the issues so much easier. So what did you think about Absalom setting fire to Joab's fields to get his attention? Now the lesson, our questions didn't ask about this, but for some reason it, it hit me because it addresses an issue that I've often thought about. The passage seems to say <clears throat> that Absalom, while disturbingly patient on the one hand, seems to think that he can just do whatever he wants to get what he wants. Joab's not paying attention to me, so I'll just set a fire and see if that gets him moving. And guess what? It worked. 
Absalom feels a sense of power, and in some dysfunctional way, he is affirmed. So why does this hit, this hit home with me? So I read an article in the Times, uh, the East Bay Times several years ago, talking about a growing tendency in our society of entitlement, especially among young people, who espouse the philosophy of live and let live as long as it doesn't hurt anyone. I've heard that from my own adult kids. With tongue in cheek, the author ended the article by saying this, in short, we, their parents, told them they were special and they believed us. When I look at the elements of rebellion that I have experienced with my own children, it's easy for me to see some grains of truth in that. We were certainly not passive. We didn't let the kids get away with murder and in no way Am I suggesting that anybody listening to this is raising a little Amnon or, you know, a, a little Absalom? But even in our Christian homes, we need to be so careful that we are holding up God's standards in love, raising our children as members of community, family, church, school, town, nation, where, yes, our individual needs and desires are important, but more important is what God has to say about how we live and what we do. Our children are special in God's eyes, and that is how we want them to understand that word. Absalom thought he was so special that he could literally get away with murder, with blackmail, with deception, with rebellion, and the cost will be high as we will see next week. But there's another side to this. What if we are caught in the whirlwind that somebody else got going, like Tamar? There are actually two kinds of whirlwinds. First are the ones that we sow ourselves. They arise out of our own sin. They're the ones we deserve. And God's grace will be there if we come to him in repentance. But there's also the whirlwind that we don't deserve, the one that arises out of the sin of others. God's grace is there too, but how do we cope with that storm when it seems so unfair? In my life, both of those situations have come in the form of a rebellious child. And this lesson held a whole lot of 2020 hindsight moments concerning parenting issues and challenging children. And maybe you have similar situations. So many, many consequences for the sinner, for those sinned against, for those who are just getting the shrapnel of whatever has blown up. But God's grace is healing. His mercy is present. His hope is eternal. And tomorrow, is yet another day to pray and to know that he is holding us firm as that wind whirls. We have to keep remembering that sin hurts everyone and often for years to come. So let's look now at the final chapter, chapter 15, a chapter that talks about rebellion. And this is a broad-scale rebellion by David's family, his friends, and his subjects. And we'll be looking at four main pieces of it. We'll first look at Absalom, who has now become a thief, a thief of hearts, the hearts of the people, and a thief of the crown. And then we have Ahithophel, who was David's friend, who has become a traitor. Then we have the Israelites themselves, they are gullible and they have been swayed by Absalom, many of them into following him into rebellion. And then finally we have David who is now on the run. So as the chapter opens, we see Absalom, the politician. He is looking good, he's talking smooth, he's shaking hands, he's kissing babies. Today he would be, prom be promising an end to war, everybody can have a job, there'll be lower taxes and early retirement. 
He probably posed for photos while eating the Israelite equivalent of barbecued chicken. That would be falafel and shawarma. Clearly, Absalom is winning the popular vote, and his goal is the throne of Israel. We have one problem. Dad is still on that throne. And so begins the rebellion. David is betrayed by his counselor and his cousin, you know, we're still in this sin group here, Ahithophel. And in that sad twist that we read about, many of David's subjects were swayed by the promises of Absalom. So David is now on the run and he flees Jerusalem. We see a, a truth today and it will be front and center next week. Hardship in David's life brings out the best in him. Like is true for so many of us, his humiliation brings him to a place of humility before God, and he prays. Magnificently, as we read in the Psalms this week and in prior weeks as well, but especially in the Psalms associated with the events of this lesson. When he is forced from the throne, David seems to get a grasp again on the fact that it really isn't his throne at all. That, yes, he is a king of men. He himself, however, serves the king of kings, and there is only room for one, capital O, one, on that throne. His sin, the sins of his sons and his nephews and all those other relatives, bring home the point that sin hurts everyone. So do we have a job to do in the light of this lesson? You bet we do. Are we ignoring sin that needs confronting in our lives or in our family? Are we walking around elephants or sweeping skeletons under the rug and in doing that, teaching others who are watching us to do the same. If we are, then it is our responsibility to begin dealing with those skeletons and elephants before, excuse the mixed analogy, they become the buried bomb that suddenly explodes or the wind that becomes a whirlwind. That's a lesson from David that we don't want to repeat. And as our commentary will point out, there is an amazing parallel to Jesus in the final verses of chapter 15, as David goes up the Mount of Olives. Those steps of David prefigure those taken by his future son, his future sinless son, Jesus, on that night that we now remember as Holy Thursday. Both cross the Kidron Valley, David weeping, Jesus weeping, David humiliated and cursed, Jesus humiliated, spat upon, beaten, David silent in the face of his enemies, Jesus silent before his accusers, both accepting the will of God for the future battle and its outcome. Max Lucado says in his book that he calls, And the Angels Were Silent, that as Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane that night, there at the foot of the Mount of Olives, the true sign of his victory was his submission to the following day. And as he finished praying, Lucado says this, Jesus was at peace in the olive trees, for it was in the garden that he made his decision. He would rather go to hell for you than go to heaven without you. The whirlwind still swirls, and Jesus still has paid the price for you and for me. Let's pray. Lord, so many practical things in this lesson, and how much we would love to distance ourselves and say, no, that's not me. And yet, if we really look into our heart of hearts, each one of us will find a peace that is me. So as we go forth into the relationships of our lives. May we just take a few moments this week in this new year to perhaps resolve that we will do something that will help improve even one relationship. And in improving that relationship, we will become closer to the one whose relationship we desire most of all, that of our Heavenly Father. 
and it is in the name of his sinless son, Jesus Christ, that we pray. Amen. Have a happy new year, everybody.